Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. The first time I heard the saying that the beautiful ones are not yet born, I needed no confirmation from anybody to understand what that meant, because I keep seeing more beautiful women every day. I definitely will express doubt if the same is said of talent, at least not with the likes of Sylvia Sidney. She is one lady who came to Hollywood with a peculiar talent and attraction that is very difficult to find her replica in the industry. With those cold but deadly movie eyes that made her a perfect match for the sabotage. Did Sylvia Sidney use her tool to win roles? I hope you know, my viewers, how much I appreciate you. Thank you for your generous comments and for the Patreons. This channel would not have been successful without you. Big thanks to those who watched the video right to the end. Subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Sylvia Sidney, Box Office Poison or Real Talent? It was summer holiday at the time. I was out of town somewhere in the hinterland looking for fun that I couldn't find anywhere until I stumbled upon what I should describe as my mother's movie archive. I recalled instantly she was a big fan of Golden Age Hollywood actresses. Then something reminded me of Sylvia Sidney and her subtle nature. It was fun as a child hearing my mother talk about this actress back in the vibrant old days, so I decided to put on hold my vacation so I could remind my audience about this lovely lady that was portrayed seemingly in movies as the opposite of what she truly represents in reality. Sydney's physical look would make almost anyone mistake her true origin. Just like many of her fans, I grew up learning that she was of Jewish descent, contrary to what I had always thought but more interesting is the fact that her parents must have migrated from Eastern Europe. Funnily enough, a writer once described her as the Jewish lady with the saddest eyes in Hollywood. That insinuation may not be out of place, because Sidney did have a cute face that served her well like a trademark each time fans saw her come on stage. Sylvia Sidney became famous after scintillating performances in the 1930s, showing majorly as a partner to gangsters alongside prominent actors of her era. She was recorded as among the initial American film actresses to work with Alfred Hitchcock, and made a kill with her show in Sabotage of 1936. As a strong character actress, Sidney's talent was also felt in the theatres and later on television. Just very few actresses went through her kind of screen torture because of the roles she played. While her career commenced with the advent of sound productions, critics think that she may have possessed the natural qualities of the silent picture era, with many of her extreme helpless and fragile qualities that are typical of famous silent screen icons, like Lillian Gish. You may need to take a look at her full portrait so you can see how her elfin figure houses those heart-shaped face and sunken eyes that you always see among the poor and saddened heroines. Staring at Sidney's indifferent facial, one would agree with producers and directors who exploited her innate quality of introversion, sweetness and deceptive modesty to form her on-screen typecast character. An analyst once said that something about her look portrayed a chilling figure that is largely unpredictable and terrifying. She was an excellent actress, effectively used in the movies as a casualty until she was able to rescue her society from the Martians. Do I hear you say movies can lie? I don't think so. That's why they're called movies, designed to entertain you and nothing else. Sylvia Sidney, who was once quoted to have said that she was paid to shed tears in movies, is surely among the remarkable Golden Age talent that you can find so easily among contemporary actresses. Sidney's splendour was so unique that a writer wrote about her as having enormous eyes that are both innocent and sensuous. Her somewhat inviting lips with that bashful voice naturally depict a well-groomed lady in distress. I got to learn much about this Hollywood talent that has a way of springing screen surprises from my mother, who was an ardent fan of her movies. She once told me how she could relate to some of the things Sidney went through in films, and so out of curiosity I decided to check on her background, and here is what I found. Sylvia Sidney was the Bronx, New York-born Sophia Kozow. Her birth took place on 8th of August 1910, and by that she became an American citizen, though her mother Rebecca, formerly known as Sapastein, was a Romanian Jew, and her Russian-Jewish immigrant father, Victor Kozow, served as a fashion salesman. 
The way you rarely read about Sydney among pre-code celebrity stars kept me wondering recently, especially when I got to learn surprisingly that her stage, film and television career lasted for more than 70 years. As a child she had her fair share of parental discomfort because by 1915 her parents were divorced, and when her mother remarried a dentist identified as Sigmund Sidney, she was appropriately fostered by stepfather Sigmund as an adopted child, prompting her surname to be changed accordingly to Sidney. As a teenager, her parents encouraged her to go into the entertainment industry after noticing her shyness as a youngster with little traces of vocal hem and haw. So as early as 15, she began an acting career after acquiring the requisite knowledge as a trainee of the Theatres Guild School for Acting, where she impressed her teachers and the stage critics, who acknowledged her natural talent after watching her performances. Sydney made her initial movie appearance in 1926 as an extra in D. W. Griffiths's The Sorrows of Satan. The next year she appeared in Washington, followed by her first leading role in Misdemeanor Pictures on Broadway. It was not until 1930 when she played in Bad Girl in New York that she got the attention of Paramount head B. P. Schulberg, who subsequently offered her a contract, even as their contract extended beyond the office and into bonding romantically as the duo became lovers. Her romance with Schulberg made onlookers start wondering if she used her tool to win her first acting role, even as she was said to have been used as an immediate replacement for Clara Bow, who was supposed to appear in the City Streets production. During the era of the Great Depression, Sydney was busy with her career, appearing in a series of movies and attracting to herself the typecast role of one to be pitied. If she was not seen as the girlfriend of a gangster, she takes the role of the sister. Significantly appearing with famous screen icon Gary Cooper in what appeared to be a career breakthrough in City Streets of 1931, where a remarkable scene shows Gary, who was her fraudulent lover, visiting and trying to embrace her through the wire net of her jail cubicle. The ensuing mood portrayed her as a responsive girl that stood for her father to the extent of answering for a crime he committed, a scenario that critics say gave her instant fame. She also co-starred the likes of Spencer Tracy, Frederick March, Henry Fonda, Joel McRae, George Raft and Cary Grant at different times in 1931, as seen in An American Tragedy, Street Scene and others. She became not just a choice actress for famous producers, but her role was also financially rewarding, as Sydney was said to be among the highest earning actresses at the time, making about $10,000 weekly. When Alfred Hitchcock cast her in Sabotage, she was said to have earned a cumulative sum of $80,000 from the film, a film that saw her playing a character that showed her slaughtering her husband with a knife in 1936. After her pitiable role in Madame Butterfly, which was directed by Russian-born Marion Goering, who also made six of Sydney's films, a production that followed a similar typecast role of victimisation, some US servicemen in the Far East, was reported to have christened performance condoms as Sylvia Sidney. That was how deeply emotional her acting was. After appearing in several classic films and playing dozens of leading roles, even a kid would not doubt her steady rise to stardom. She was making the money and growing her popularity, and as someone did suggest, she blaze her trail all through the 1930s. She continued her promising screen display in You Only Live Once, and in Dead End in 1937, plus the initial three-strip Technicolor movie The Trail of the Lonesome Pine. At this time there were reports of her having issues on set. Some analysts think she grew more confident about herself, or something that she took an infamous reputation of being difficult to work with. I think it's just natural for such a thing to occur in people's career life, especially when their interest is threatened. Sydney was a smart lady as part of her true nature, and so at this juncture the people she worked with saw her as being picky and unpredictable, and she would not hesitate to make an emotional outburst, even to the extent of flinging objects at her colleagues. This was said to have also contributed to Schulberg's loss of faith in her, even though he was out of importance in her life and the industry at the time. She became tired of her stereotyped role and wanted something new, 
but directors and producers did not think it was wise to allow her to express her talent in different kinds of roles, which she had desired at the time. It is no gain saying that she might be aiming for an award or something that she had not gotten. But that did not stop her from doing her show, though it affected her career a little because of the unwritten rules about actors and producers in Hollywood, as her movie career took a downturn within the 1940s. It was so bad for her that she started thinking of another option for herself. The more reason she tended more to stage performances within the early 1940s, the media was quick to confront her with a question as to know if she was ditching the movies for the stage productions. Sidney told them that she was not, rather that she was repackaging herself. I never adjusted. If I make a movie, they called me a stage actress. If I was in a play, they called me a movie actress, she had said. To worsen her issues, exhibitors in 1949 labelled her box office poison. She later got some accolades in her 1952 role as Fantine in Les Miserables, although the film failed because it was below the studio's standard. Still looking for a fresh start, Sidney reunited with her ex-co-star Bergen on the premiere of the brief The Polly Bergen Show on television and on other TV shows within the 1960s. Route 66, The Defenders and My Three Sons readily come to mind here. To confirm her rise to fame and a large number of fans, including My Precious Mother, Sylvia Sidney got nominated for the Academy Award as Best Supporting Actress for her show in Summer Wishes Winter Dreams in 1973. For a long period, up to 17 years, Sidney was out of service in movies. Somehow she made a strategic return that year, appearing as Joanna Woodward's mother in the movie. Described as a witty, temperate and fun-loving woman, Sidney's romance with Schulberg ended naturally when she fell in love with her first husband, publisher Bennett Kerf. She had smitten the young man who fell hook, line and sinker in a whirlwind romance, which saw them quickly tie the knot in matrimony on the 1st of October 1935. But the two ambitious lovers had their different expectations that made their brief union rocky, and just six months after they were already divorced. Sometime later, Bennett spoke about his union with Sidney, telling those who cared to know that people should never legalise a hot romance. Sidney had a more fruitful relationship with her second husband, who was an actor and instructor identified as Luther Adler, whom she met and married in 1938. The union produced a son named Jacob, who unfortunately died of Lou Gehrig's disease in 1987, leaving his mother behind even though the couple was already divorced 40 years before then, sometime in 1946. Sidney later married radio producer and announcer Carlton Allsop, but that too ended in 1951. This richly talented lady decided to focus on her talent and did not limit her creativity to the screen, as she also put her pen to paper and wrote two books on Needlepoint and Bread Pug Dogs. One good thing about her wonderful knack is that she never gave up on anything, as she continued doing her show, not minding the upward movement of her age. Recall that she got maximum attention when in 1988 she played a part as Juno, the case worker in the spirit world, in Tim Burton's production known as Beetlejuice, a role that later gave her a Saturn Award as Best Supporting Actress. After her show in Damien, Omen 2, she became a major TV personality, and her talent was said to have been presented to a fresh generation of cinema-goers, not forgetting, of course, her role in Vim Vendor's Hammett in 1982. Few of those who saw her initial and later career, including my mother, were excited as they recognised her face, but not her name in particular. So they were like, hey, is that Sylvia Sidney of the 1930s? A lot did change between then and the Sydney of the 1970s and up to the 1990s. These later years saw her playing more supporting roles that did not do much for her name in terms of credit, and expectedly the years were no longer on her side. She had been transformed from the honeyed innocent damsel to a brittle old lady described as a short-tempered dame with a rough smoker's voice. Significantly, her screen roles also changed from those negatives to more gratifying roles. Still in my quest to know more about Sylvia Sidney, I got to learn that apart from acting, she took part in an AIDS study, and after her son's demise from ALS, she joined in research and activism for Lou Gehrig's disease. Sylvia Sidney died on the 1st of July 1999, 
as a result of esophageal cancer at the Lenox Hill Hospital in Manhattan, where she went through unsuccessful chemotherapy. The incident occurred about a month before she turns 89. If only wishes were horses. I know her teeming fans, like my mother, would not hesitate to turn the hands of time, so Sydney can continue to act, because the industry is yet to find her replica. Only a very few actresses went through Sylvia's kind of screen torture, but there were real-life struggles as well in Hollywood. How was Rosalind Russell's confidence damaged by the studios? Watch this video.